Cracked Asphalt by Richard Elslinger. It's not fair. I never saw it coming. I feel the searing pain of breaking bones and spilling blood. My body flies high in the air and I land on the asphalt with a nasty thump. This is my life. This is actually happening to me. My head aches and I can only see blackness through my open eyes. It feels like my brain has been sucked right out of my skull. I sense my blood leaving my flesh like a gushing garden hose, spraying my life to the outside world with each beat of my heart. Though I cannot see, I hear voices as a crowd forms around me. Oh, the pain is so intense. I want it to end. I beg for it to end. And within a minute, it does. I feel my last breath leave my body and I cannot draw another. I feel tranquil, at peace. I don't want to die, but it seems I don't have a choice. My body gives up, letting me go, releasing me from its encapsulation. I am standing on the asphalt. I can see my body stretched out over the road. The car that struck me, the whole front end is crumpled, and there is one massive dent in the roof and another on the trunk lid. I must have gone right over the car. I see the crowd standing in a semicircle staring down at my busted body as if united by primeval human emotions, an unspoken ritualistic behavior that honors the passing of a life, my passing. It is a very strange feeling to die. I desperately want to go back to being alive, but I don't know how. I have no idea where this is headed, and I am terrified of what will happen next. I do have the expectation of a brilliant light to take me away. I am not terribly religious, but the consensus of the living, a club of which I belonged just minutes before, is that a bright light and eternal peace ensue when the soul leaves the body. I am not seeing any bright light, but I am seeing flashing red and blue lights. Three police squad cars park in my vicinity and officers exit their vehicles. They begin taking measurements while one officer maintains a friendly vigilance watching over me. I hear him offering soothing words telling me that everything is going to be okay. Another officer interrogates the driver who hit me, and I hear him tell a blatant lie, claiming I came running right out of nowhere and he couldn't avoid me. I didn't come out of nowhere. I wasn't running. I did no such thing. He's lying. I activated the cross lights and made sure the way was clear before I entered the road. I shout my protestations, and they fall on deaf ears. He hit me squarely in the crosswalk, of that I can be certain. I had the right of way, now it appears I was dead right. The ambulance arrives, not far behind law enforcement, to perform their ghoulish role. It's like watching my own nightmarish movie, where I have unwittingly been nominated to play the lead part. I can see the paramedics performing their necessary medical protocols on me, none of which are working. I sense weightlessness, a lack of mass. The paramedics fail in their efforts to revive me. I perceive no energy or draw of force to bring me back to my body. From where I stand, I knew they would fail. I feel a profound sense of sadness, seeing myself lay there motionless on the road. It's me. That's actually me sprawled out, cold dead, and I find it hard to believe. The paramedics push the crowd back and lift my body up, putting me on the stretcher. I want to leave the scene to go with my corporeal self in the ambulance, to be at my side and give myself some comfort, but I cannot. A weird force holds me in place. My movements are constricted. I look down to my feet and see cracks in the asphalt, long crevices in the black tar that affix me to this spot. The ambulance leaves and the crowd gradually dissipates, walking away to resume their everyday lives, heading to their predetermined destinations before I so rudely interrupted their daily routines with my personal tragedy. I watched the officers on scene who remained for what felt like a few hours, and upon completion of their investigation, I witnessed the last squad car drive away. Orange paint marks display the spot where I expired, not the cartoonish chalk body outlines one might expect, but rather spray-painted dots and circles. Traffic resumes in the aftermath, and I see cars coming and going, I stay fixed to my spot, a vulnerable spot in the middle of the road, yet vehicles pass right through my body, which terrifies me at first. 
My terror turns to amusement as they have no effect on me. The force of their mass, their driving presence, can do no damage to me anymore. I want to leave this gory scene and explore this new plane of existence, but realize I still cannot leave. I am confined to a small area of asphalt, invisible boundaries surrounding me on all four sides, these barriers holding me steadfast, affording me very little room to move. A streak of terror invades my psyche and I realize that in death I can still experience fear. I also have legs, arms, a torso and a head in this realm and I can apparently still think. Everything that I possessed in life appears to have followed me in death. But I cannot move from this small patch of asphalt perforated by a multitude of cracks and crevices. Why? Hours go by or so I think. Though I have no sense of time in this place, I still have the power of observation. It is twilight now, and I am fearful of what will happen next. Where is this brilliant afterlife? I recount my existence. I know I led a decent life. I wait for fulfillment. I see no reason why I should be denied. I deserve salvation. So I wait, and I wait. Nightfall comes, and the cars are less frequent but the ones that do approach come at me with blinding headlights. They drive right through me as the others did earlier in the day. I look up to the stars, wishing to join them, but I remain stuck here. Cloud cover obscures the moon. It's a windy night, and soon the cloud cover blows over to reveal the moon's brightness in full display. I see a car approaching in the distance. It turns on the high beam headlights, coming toward me at high speed. At the last moment, it slams on the brakes, just feet from where I stand. The car passes through me in dramatic fashion and stops several car lengths beyond. I can see the driver adjust his rearview mirror. His eyes are wide with astonishment. He hits the gas and peels away, leaving a long line of rubber. Did he see a ghost, I muse? His reaction is that of someone who saw a ghost. Another car approaches and swerves around me passing over to the other lane to avoid my spectral presence. They can see me. How can they see me? Am I truly dead? They call it the afterlife, so perhaps I am dead in one way, but alive in another. Maybe this is just a nightmare. Maybe I'll wake up and find myself in bed. Oh, how I wish that to be true. The cloud cover returns and obscures the moon. I see the occasional car again, and they drive through me once more, failing to notice my presence. It would seem that the moon has some power over my visibility, making the world aware of my ghostly existence. The night ends and morning twilight is upon me. With its advent, I have a strange sensation, a horrible feeling of disintegration, a sense that I am literally coming apart at the seams. My body, if I can still call it that, begins to degrade and separate. I feel every molecule shatter into its smaller constituents and they fall like tiny ball bearings to the ground and roll into the cracks where I stand. My eyes are the last thing to come undone and I see the rising sun one more time before I get pulled into the blackness below, my entire supernatural existence sucked into the ground. I disappear from the light of day and I am gone from this world, on to another. It is a peculiar thing to come apart, to actually disintegrate. In the darkness, I sense my body floating like a dissipated cloud of electrons in a wide expanse, unable to bring itself back together again. Yet I can still think. My mind remains intact in this bizarre state of being. I am a cloud of consciousness floating aimlessly beneath the surface of the road where I died, and I can do nothing to reconstitute my being. I sense nothing but blackness. I perceive the faintest shred of light coming from distant cracks above me, presumably the surface where I stood last night, and then the light winks out. In this place I can only ascertain the nothingness of non-existence. Could this be hell? I have to assess my situation. I go through a mental drill. Down here I have no sense of smell. I have no sense of touch. There is no sense of sound. As a cloud of incorporeal electrons, I still have a voice, but I can only hear my voice in my conscious mind. As for sight, all I can see is a pure blackness of infinite space. There is no reference point for any of my five senses, 
if in fact my senses still exist. I have no sense of hunger, no sense of thirst. I have no sense of time. I can only estimate time's passage. Before long, I feel myself rising upward, headlong toward the surface. I pass through the cracks of dilapidated asphalt, forced once more to the surface, and my displaced molecules begin to reassemble themselves. I am turning human again, or the reasonable facsimile of a human. Once again, it is twilight and I see cars. Tonight I notice the occasional pedestrian crossing within the crosswalk where I died. Cloud cover obscures the moon. I stand vigilant here, unable to extricate myself from this mysterious prison. Tonight I go unnoticed by cars. They drive through me unabated. A low-level, ruminating sense of panic occupies my thoughts. I want out of here. Get me away from this place. Get me away from this constant reminder of the place where I spent my last moments among the living. There must be another level of existence. There must be a heaven or some other realm where I may enjoy a respite for all eternity. I would even accept the Valhalla from Scandinavian lore. But redemption doesn't arrive tonight. Again, I repeat the phenomenon of disintegration and dissipation. Again, I find myself a vaporous cloud of consciousness beneath the surface of the road, surrounded in darkness. How long can this go on? This cyclical routine goes on and on with no apparent end in sight. I am cognizant of time's passing as I can see its passage with the changing of the seasons. I also see the movement of time with the changing designs of automobiles that travel the road. Old models come and go, getting replaced with even newer models. I begin to see vehicles of wild and exotic designs. They are powered by remarkable engines with capabilities I never knew possible. They make strange whooshing sounds as they race by me, unlike the raucous fossil fuel cars of the past. And my ghostly presence persists when the moon is full, continuing to scare drivers and the odd pedestrian as I fade in and fade out of the world that is the living. I think back to my school days and my studies and remember the concept of limbo, a place between heaven and hell, a place of waiting, a place without pain, a resting place between two extremes. What I do not understand is why I am in this place, and more to the point, how long must I remain here? On some nights I scream to the level of madness, other nights I sob without control. At other times I remain resolute that I will win the long game, I will win salvation. And then one lonely night I see it approach, a horse-drawn carriage projecting light from dim, oil-filled lamps. Is this a hallucination? The carriage draws ever closer, pulled by a team of black horses. I have this overwhelming sense of dread. At the same time, I sense elation. It draws closer. The carriage door comes to a stop right before me. The faceless coachman, shrouded in a cloak of midnight blue, opens the door to the carriage. When that door opens, I see a blinding white light that envelops me. The coachman says nothing but stares straight ahead. I speak to the coachman and ask what is expected of me. The coachman makes no answer. Instinctively, I know that I have been offered a choice, and somehow I know that whatever I decide, the choice will be irrevocable. Daylight is in the offing, yet I make no move, paralyzed with indecision. Before long, I witness the first molecules of my existence unravel. The disintegration of my incorporeal being starts its familiar cycle. There is precious little time left. I take a step toward the carriage door and my leg crumbles to pieces beneath me while my intact leg gets some purchase on the stairs. I lose my balance. I hang onto the carriage railing for stability, torn between two dimensions. For the first time in a long time, I feel intense pain. I think of Charon, the ferryman of Hades. Charon is here, the coachman of the open road. The psychopomp of my dreams, or possibly my nightmares, has arrived. Either way, my time has come, and in the end, if indeed there is an end, the choice is mine. The choice will always be mine. <laughs>